Okay, hey everybody. Um, hope you guys are doing well. So we got a few of us ready to go. Uh, yeah, we're waiting until 2.30. It's about 2.26. Good afternoon, Adeline. Good to see you there. Anybody else here, feel free to say hello over in the chat. Um, you guys have been having a good week and all your classes are going smooth. Yeah, hi Jocelyn. <clears throat> good to see you. Isabel, Singh, Judy, Flavio. That's this whole group. Appreciate you guys, Brittany. Okay. I'm doing pretty well today. Uh, you know, had some meetings early in the morning. They went pretty smooth and I think I had some good lectures. So it's not all right. Um, hey, Joshua, Megan, Marissa, Azura, Matthew, Lena, Clarissa, Nicholas. Good to see all you guys. So just a few minutes and then we'll um, jump into today's meeting and uh, get our notes that we need for the coming quiz and stuff like that. <laughs> hey, Miguel. Flavio, your request for my artwork is just, I mean, I don't know, man. I mean, putting me on the spot, I feel kind of like, I don't know. It's like I'm, in a way, it's like a disgrace of how bad I am at drawing stuff, you know what I mean? So it's like, there's some insecurities there. You gotta, know, you gotta understand that. But, you know, um, I could I could try, I could try. Give me a minute though, I need to, I need to get focused on this lecture real quick. But. But maybe at the end, when we get time at the end. You know, as a kid, I was better at it. All that academic philosophy maybe just took away the skills. I mean, I'm good at other type of art, like music and stuff. But um, when it comes to drawing, painting, I don't know. Maybe I'll take it up as a hobby when I'm retired or something. Get a you know, full canvas and just go off, like just paint whatever. But I like the concept. I love art. I love the museums. Um, so we'll see. Here, I got another chapter left for me. I'm done with this philosophy gig in the future. <clears throat> the bird, well, you know. I'll draw some other pictures later, maybe in this class, but for now. Do I know how to dance? I got rhythm, um, but I never really took dance lessons or you know focused on it. But um, I definitely have really good rhythm. I play you know, the bass for a long time, and um, I'm always on time, so I have good rhythm. I could be a good dancer, probably, if I really wanted to. Yeah, I could sing. I mean, I have some musical projects where I sing. What kind of music do I like listening to? Rap music. And other than that, like, electronic stuff and, like, some kind of rock music, too. I like metal. I like emo. Um, but my go-to music is rap music, trap, like crazy, current, contemporary rap music. Um, my favorite rapper, man, there's so many of them out there. You put me on the spot now. Um, well, I don't know. Like, I really like, you know, like Chief Keef and like, I don't know. I really like the Migos, even though now they're like huge. But I saw them when they were still kind of coming up. Um, at some clubs in LA. It was really, really fun. All right, guys. Um, oh, you mean you're talking about Travis Scott's like? He's making, he got like cereals and like everything. No, I have not had Travis Scott's products. To me, he's decent, but he's not the greatest rapper. That, that whole thing, like halfway singing and using auto tune, I don't know. It's not that hard to me. But, anyways, welcome back, everybody. Good to see you guys. Glad that you're all here. So, um, what we're going to do today is kind of finish the rest of the notes from chapter one. Lil Uzi's great. Definitely one of the best. You've heard that song, What's Up, with him in future. The video is really crazy, it's got a bunch of deep fake. Um, clips, you know, turning everybody into those guys. Anyway, yeah. Um, so anyway, back to what I was going to say. We're going to finish the material in Chapter 1 right now. And then um, you guys have all turned in your homework, so good. Thank you for that. I'm going to post the answer key for the homework, um, I think, tomorrow. And then um, and I'll also give anybody who requests via an email to me their grade and their comments for the first homework. So. I just need another day to finish grading them and to uh, post the answer key. 
some people that turn them in late, I don't want to give the answers out until they have that chance. So, um, so I'll just, you know, give you guys a detailed message through Titanium that shows you all the answers and that um, if you would like, you, of course, can request your score. I want you to be able to get your score, so I'll be looking for your emails um, so that I can have a personal message back to you and give you any comments if you would like those. So that's the plan that has to do with the first assignment that we've all turned in already. And the next thing is the quiz that's on Monday. So I'm hoping to get through all the notes on Chapter 1 today. And if I could do that, then we'll go ahead with our quiz Monday. Um, I'll also give you guys a study guide for the quiz. Um, if I can, I'll talk to you about some of the topics today in the meeting. And then if I don't get to it, then it'll definitely be in the detailed study guide. So all right, let's go back into our notes then for a minute. Um, so we've talked so far in this Chapter 1 about what are some of these And we talked about the phases of cognitive development, and then we just talked about all the qualities that good critical thinkers usually have, uh, and then we also talked about some of the benefits. I think that we left off finishing with the topic that um, you benefit from being a good critical thinker by, by having a greater sense of self-esteem and personal confidence, you're better at planning things and making rational plans for your own life, and you're a better, more um, well-informed citizen in a democracy capable of uh, casting a wise vote based on the facts and evidence and your, uh, the interest that you have in your political community has. So the next part, um, as chapter one continues, is there's some discussion of the three stages of the critical thinking process. So um, the author of the text um, has you know, looked at studies which claim that in thinking critically, there's actually a sort of three-phase process to that. Um, not to be confused with the three stages of cognitive development, this is a different three-part analysis of the concept. So three stages of critical thinking. Okay, so there's first stage experience, second stage interpretation, And then the third stage is analysis. Experience, interpretation, and analysis. So um, the first part of the process, experience, that is just when a person describes what their experience was, but they don't take that extra step yet to try and explain why it happened or how it happened. It's just what happened. So it's like the what of the critical thinking process. What happened, this is what happened. Um, so trying to figure out why it happened uh, comes later. But you gotta start somewhere. There has to be some type of experience to explain or to understand for critical thinking to kick in. So you start off with just some experience. This is when um, one describes their experience, one describes what their experience was, without yet trying to understand why or how it happened. Okay, I know it's a little compressed on the board and it might be a little hard to read, so I'm gonna put that in the chat really fast. Give me a second. So it's there in the chat in the typed version of the notes. Um, so, you know, you have an experience or maybe just something happens in the world, whether it directly involves you or not. Um, and it could be any number of different things. Um, my partner broke up with me. I got an F on my test. I got an A on my test. Um, my partner proposed to me. Um, my bike was stolen. I got a speeding ticket. I got the job. I didn't get the job. You know, so these are all just examples of experiences that a person could have, and that's where the critical thinking process starts, you just say what happened. Um, now in other cases, it might have to do with some just event that occurred, even if it's not something that directly uh, happened to you per se, 
like so you could say um donald trump won the presidential election in 2016 you know that's just like something that happened or um there's wildfires that are happening all around in california so just an event or an experience that a person either has themselves or observes in the world okay but that's not where the critical thinking process stops it continues yeah. from there to the next level which is interpretation so at the second stage interpretation you do try now to give that explanation uh, as to why or how the thing happened that was experienced at the first level. So one tries to explain why or how the, the event happened, the experience happened. says there one tries to explain why or how the event happened. So after having an experience or noting some event, um, a good critical thinker doesn't just want to move on and be like, oh, that's something that happened. Stuff just keeps happening. The critical thinkers among us want to know why those things have happened. And that's important because if something good that has happened, you want to know why and you want to know how so that maybe you could reproduce that in the future. Or if it's something bad that happened, then you want to know why or how so that you can maybe avoid it in the future. But if you don't know why or how, or if you don't have any ability to judge why or how, then you won't be able to take those actions. So, um, you know, let's say you, you, got, you didn't get the job, and your first thought is kind of like maybe a little bit self-serving. Um, you know, so your thought might be, oh, it's because I'm not friends with the employer. You know, maybe, maybe you got to be personal friends with this employer to get the job. Or maybe they didn't like my outfit, you know. I wore like a little bit of a a loud tie with too much color or something, and they, that put the person off. So, you know, you give some interpretation, some attempt to explain why. The partner broke up with you. That's the event, let's suppose. Maybe your first interpretation is kind of self-serving in that case. It could be like, oh, it's because the person's evil. You know, they just wanted to hurt me. They're not who I thought they were. They were I thought they were a good person, but they're actually really mean, and they just wanted to hurt me, so they broke up, and that's the reason why. So notice what I've given you here, just a few examples of some experiences that a person may then try to explain uh, by means of giving an interpretation as to why. Um, the problem, though, is this. There's a third level, and the third level is there because sometimes our initial interpretation of an event can be a little bit biased. Maybe it's formed sometimes hastily or due to emotional factors. Um, so you owe it to yourself to kind of give yourself another shot at explaining why. And that's what the analysis third stage is. So that's when you actually go back to your previous interpretation of the event and you ask yourself, is this the right interpretation or is there a better one, a better different one? So you consider whether the previous interpretation was right or if there is a better alternative. Let me put that at the top because it's getting a little bit pressed at the bottom in terms of space. So I'm just going to number it then three. And three is analysis. So that's when um, <clears throat> one considers... whether their previous interpretation was correct. Or is there a better alternative interpretation? All right, so there you have the third and last level or stage of a critical thinking process. So you gotta start off by having some experience or witnessing or observing one in the world. Then you move on to try and give some explanation as to why, why did that thing happen? I'm interpreting reasons now. At the third stage, you reconsider the interpretation itself and you allow yourself to reconsider it or replace it with a different one. Because sometimes as you gain distance from the original events, you are able to be a little bit more objective about why. So in some of these cases that I mentioned, the breakup, that's the experience, that's what it was, the why, the interpretation stage could be the person's evil and vindictive uh, and cruel, and then you think about it later as you go past some time and you're like, well, you know, I'm analyzing my own interpretation and maybe that was just a little bit too self-serving. In fact, if I think about it seriously, it could be because I forgot the person's birthday or uh, you know, because I was really mean to them at one time and yelled at them, so that could be the right actual explanation. 
or in the job interview case. The first interpretation was what? They didn't like my outfit. I guess that's why I didn't do the job. But then they think more about it and they're like, maybe it's because I lied on my job application about my uh, references or something. Person got an F on a quiz. That's what happened. First interpretation, why? The professor's terrible. They don't know how to teach. Um, yeah, I'll type it. Don't worry, Jamie. So professors can't teach. They don't know how to explain the material. So that's why I did poorly on the exam. But then, you know, they check with their classmates and these classmates tell them, no, we all did really good. Um, at that point, you know, they might have to reconsider their previous interpretation and then they look at their preparation for the test, maybe the fact that they didn't read the book or, you know, study any of the material or whatever. So critical thinkers and just everyday people that are wise conclusions is to go through the process that you see here. When something happens, think about why and then allow yourself to be open-minded enough to reconsider your own interpretation at a future time. Okay. One considers whether their previous interpretation is correct or is there Sorry, not this. Is there a better alternative interpretation? Okay, so we see it there in the chat and we've had that discussion. The book basically says the same. Maybe I'll add some of the comments from the book. Um, like for example, here on page um, 21, I was turned down for the job that I interviewed for, experience, interpretation. I didn't have the right connection. My lack of connections, or maybe my poor interview, or maybe the lack of qualifications in my resume. Um, so anyway, it's that kind of process. I, you know, I don't know if I told you guys about my bike. Did I ever mention that thing about the bike? Um, I had a bike. It was a good bike. It was a classic bike. It's like an old Schwinn Collegiate. If you look that up, it's like one of the old 1970s models. Very sturdy. They don't make them like that anymore. I bought it used off of someone from the internet. And I had this bike for like 15 years. Um, but then when I moved into a new apartment, I was leaving it on my balcony with no like uh, lock. And the reason that I did that is because it's my balcony, it's my property, and to get up to it, you actually have to climb a little bit. So I was thinking, what, is the Spider-Man gonna come up into my balcony? That's not gonna happen. So I just left it out there so that I didn't have to put it in like a garage or tie it up some somewhere else or you know bring it into the apartment itself. Then when I'm coming home from teaching one day, I look up in the balcony as I'm driving into the garage and you know I don't see the bike. So I figured something happened to it. When I got up there, it wasn't there. So I lost the bike, that's what happened. My first uh, in, in, interpretation of why was kind of like casting blame everywhere else. I'm like, ah, oh, come on, it's theft. I'm in a neighborhood where people commit you know, petty theft. Um, that just must be the nature of uh, what goes on out here. But I thought about it more and it's actually a pretty nice neighborhood and you know, I started thinking, well, I didn't secure my bike, so I didn't take precautions against it getting stolen, and it's on display to the whole neighborhood because anyone going down PCH would see this bike, you know, sitting up there. So maybe I share some of the blame at least. Of course, no one has the right to take your stuff, even if it's not locked. But uh, if I really wanted to prevent against this theft, I probably could have taken more precautions. So I learned the lesson. If I get another bike, it's always going to get locked. I don't care if someone has to take some kind of little effort to get up to where it's at. Now, Sean, you say this, for the analysis to change the interpretation, does it need to be new information or can someone just change their mind? I think that's a good uh, question for sure. And it can be either one, really. Sometimes you, your judgment is the thing that makes a change. You know, you believe I was, um, I was too tired when I thought about this before. I was too angry when I thought about this before. Or maybe I was too uh, under the influence of some other emotional or non-rational factor, you know? Uh, and in other cases, it can be because you get more information later. You know, you learn more stuff about the, the facts, and now you're able to give a more precise judgment. So that's really um, a good question, and I think both could be influential in the way of a person reconsidering. Now, at the same time, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. Analysis does not always mean that you're going to change the uh, previous interpretation, because sometimes you just have the right instincts or the right call uh, right off the bat. But since we're all capable of making mistakes and errors in judgment, uh, we, we should at least have that open-mindedness to um, revision of our beliefs if and when it's called for at a later time. Okay, so that's the three stages of critical thinking. Now what we're gonna talk about next is a topic in the chapter one which is all about barriers uh, to critical thinking, obstacles to critical thinking. 
Like, what are some of the things that prevent us from doing it better and, um, and doing it well? So we're going to learn about that. By knowing what those obstacles or barriers to critical thinking are, you're going to be better able to avoid those um, mistakes yourself. And you're going to be better able to sort of monitor yourself to um, direct yourself in a way that doesn't cause these, these mistakes or habits to arise. So barriers to critical thinking. All right, so um, the way it's been, you know, discussed in this book and in our class so far, we've really tried to impress the point that um, critical thinking is a good thing for you. It's, it's definitely in your best interest and it's to your advantage to be better at critical thinking rather than worse. It makes you um, more confident, having better uh, ability to make rational plans, um, lower levels of depression, rage, higher self-esteem. You're going to be a better uh, participant in democracy. Um, you're going to be able to solve problems better. So, you know, all those things are good. And you would think then, well, then why doesn't everyone just want to be a good critical thinker? Why doesn't it come naturally to people? Um, or why isn't it the default of most people if it's nothing but good and all it does is good for you? Well, the reason is because um, we develop over the course of our lives a lot of little psychological habits, intellectual habits and sometimes defense mechanisms to prevent ourselves from subjecting our own beliefs to criticism and to scrutiny. You know, for a lot of people, um, it's so uncomfortable, the thought that you might be wrong or the thought that you have to rethink something um, that you would prefer to throw up barriers to reconsideration or to critical thought instead of to engage um, in that way. So we kind of have to know that this is something that's quite widespread. People do have a tendency uh, to fall back on these bad habits, but knowing is half the battle. Once you know what these kind of tendencies and barriers are, then you'd be better able to overcome them um, in your own life. So barriers to critical thinking. We're just going to go over a bundle of terms that the text provides on this subject. So first of all, there's avoidance. Okay, so avoidance is pretty straightforward. It's, um, it's simply to avoid people or information that conflicts with your beliefs or with your views. <clears throat> Okay, so one barrier to critical thinking is simply trying to avoid contrary opinion and contrary information. So if you have some opinions, beliefs, and you hold this as like one of your traits that you practice, then you're going to kind of try to stay away from the type of people who don't agree with you. Or you're going to try and stay away from or you know, make sure that you don't gain any um, exposure to sources of information that contradict the things that you believe. But that's not a good thing. Um, there's nothing ever harmful about engaging with information and people from across a wide spectrum of opinion, belief, and, and lifestyle. Um, if you practice avoidance, you know, the thing is we live in a big world where there's a lot of different people and not everyone agrees on a lot of questions and there's a lot of conflicting information out there. And so, um, if you are in the habit of being this way, then you're going to actually cut yourself off from a lot of different, uh, possible relationships, experiences. And ideas and I would think that in the life you're living you don't want to like um, only have a narrow range of experience with only some people that have like-minded ideas it doesn't mean that by um, engaging with people who are of different opinions and beliefs that you're going to somehow have your beliefs uh, modified I mean of course if you think someone has a better argument or better reasons to offer then you might change your mind but otherwise you know you'll just have a productive exchange of ideas and you'll know better where other people are coming from so even if you don't agree with people and even if talking to those folks or listening to that information doesn't change the person's mind, it's still very good for you to be exposed to the different opinions that are out there. Um, so, so we should not necessarily go with avoidance, but of course that happens a lot. You know, people only st spending time with those that have a like-minded opinion, um, filtering out information that challenges the beliefs that a person holds. Gabby, you say, from past experience, my parents always tell me I have a tendency to be right as I explain the situation and we don't come to the conclusion that one or the other is right. I assume it's the same as avoidance. 
Yeah, I mean, um, anybody can do something like this. People of all different ages, you know, young, old, in the middle, um, because it's more comforting to a lot of people to not be facing challenges to their beliefs. And you can make sure that happens if you can identify the kind of people who are tending to agree with you and to, you know, individuate the two cases and to try and engage more with one and not with the other. Um, it would be sad, of course, in the context of a family if people can't uh, engage with each other's ideas because they're so deeply divided among themselves. Obviously, a family is where you want to go to for support and, um, and you know, a mutual meeting of the minds. So whether it's within a person's family, within their friend group, um, with their peers or colleagues, we need to be able to solicit a wide variety of opinions and to engage in debate and dialogue. That's not fighting with people. That's not being mean to each other. That's just hearing each other out and trying to understand where other people are coming from. I'd rather know where um, my um, intellectual uh, by hearing them and talking to them and trying to grasp hold with their ideas than to simply um, push it to the back of my mind or bury my head in the sand like no such things exist. So that's avoidance. Kind of the other side of the coin of avoidance is um, confirmation bias. Okay. So I'm going to give you some information on this uh, term. Confirmation bias. So they're very closely related. That's why I'm bringing them both up in the same kind of breath. Uh, but with confirmation bias, instead of avoiding things that you don't agree with, it's about pursuing information, only pursuing information that already agrees with you. Okay, so one only seeks out information that supports what they already believe. So can we see that? It just says confirmation bias definition. Um, one only seeks information that supports what they already believe. Now, um, as the word and terminology indicates, this is like a bias, a bias in favor of your own opinions, a bias which will lead you to only seek information that confirms your pre-established opinions. So it's kind of like a dishonest way of seeking out information and evidence. It's only seeking evidence and information that will uh, verify or reinforce the beliefs that you already have, but basically never taking a look at the other side or the contrary arguments or the contrary opinions. Um, so this is like avoiding stuff that you don't agree with, and this is only seeking out things that you do agree with. So say a person has confirmation bias, right? And they're like, uh, I don't know, a believer in the flat earth, you know, hopefully none of you, but someone says the earth's flat, that's their opinion and they have confirmation bias. So if they, let's say, go on the internet and like, you know, log on to Google, what kind of websites will they go to in terms of looking up info on the topic of what shape is this earth? If they're a flat earther and they have confirmation bias, then they're only gonna look at what kind of uh, sites or sources. What do you think? That's a question for you. Just let me know what you have on that. Just to make sure you process the definition and you can apply it to an example. So if the person's a flat earther and they're full of confirmation bias, then to investigate their question here, they're only going to look at what information? Where are they going to go online? Just let me know in the chat. So yeah, sites that confirm or, well, can be confirmed really in a way, it's not true, but uh, sources and stuff that seem to align with their opinion. Yeah, you say the onion, Melissa, well, or a little bit of humor, but yeah, to be real, though, like they're going to go into the world seeking out information that seems to agree with them. And then they might come back to you and be like, look, you don't believe in the flat earth? Here, I've got like 10 sources. The problem is that's a biased uh, pursuit of information that's only looking at the information that happens to agree um, and ignoring the you know vast scientific evidence and overwhelming consensus on the other side. Um, so, you know... You talk about Reddit, Flavio. Yeah, there's a lot on social media. It's kind of, um, we, uh, this phenomenon has accelerated and become almost like a, you know, a crisis in a way in our world. Because with the advent of social media and the internet, anybody can find some source of support for almost anything they believe, whether that's, you know, something really crazy or really harmful or dangerous or racist. You know, there's going to be some community on the internet that provides information that reinforces anybody's belief. And so if a person's really dishonest in the way of pursuing their information through confirmation bias, then it's like someone can wall themselves off 
in a silo of like-minded opinion, never encountering any challenges to their views, and therefore they really don't get a full picture of all the information that's out there. And then it becomes very hard for us to talk to each other because we stop agreeing on the facts, and you know, it, it tears at the bonds of society, families, friendships, institutions. So we gotta try our best to do better than that. And um, knowing that confirmation bias is a bad intellectual habit that a lot of people can fall into, it allows us to try and break free of it a little bit. Okay, so good. Um, next up, we're continuing through this little range of barriers to critical thinking. <clears throat> Okay, so there's also anger, which is kind of in a way self-explanatory, but I'm just going to mention it because it's in the book. Another barrier to critical thinking is, you know, the emotional experience of anger. Anger is, as defined in our book, instead of, um, you know, analyzing a person's opposing viewpoint, you get angry at the person who even presents the information. So instead of critically analyzing an opposing view, I'll, I'll, I'll move Peachy down here after this. I just want to put the note up there first. Instead of critically analyzing an opposing view, one gets angry at the person or source of information who provided the view or who stated the view. Okay, so... <clears throat> Sometimes people, you know, when their beliefs are challenged, they can't just have a civil discussion about these different opinions. They can't just say, all right, well, that's your opinion, and I would love to just give you my reasons as to why I don't agree. And we could just have a fair-minded uh, dialogue, debate, discussion about it with no hostility uh, among each other. Unfortunately, for some people, the natural reaction they have is to just get mad, start raising your voice. Uh, insulting the other person, banging your fist on the table, saying that's just wrong, and getting mad, showing that anger. Um, by the time you're displaying anger in response to a challenge to one of your beliefs, I think that you've really undermined your own position in the debate. Nobody thinks that you're winning an argument when you have to start getting mad at people instead of just going back to your arguments and reasons and your evidence. Um, it makes it seem rather like you don't have the um, ability to justify yourself according to reason, so you have to resort to an emotional display of anger. So an emotional overreaction to a person disagreeing with you is totally unnecessary also, uh, because uh, this person, it's like getting, it's like uh, killing the messenger. If they're telling you something that you don't agree with, let me, under, let, let me make it clear. They're not the only person in the world who believes that. There's a whole host of other people who agree with them too. So if you're going to get mad at the fact that people don't agree with you, then you're going to spend your whole life angry, because this world is a diverse world with a lot of different opinions. And so I guarantee you someone out there, no matter what your opinion is, doesn't agree with you. And uh, if you hold this hostility and anger, then you're going to carry that with you all the time. And it's not a nice way to live, to just always be mad and angry about the fact that not everyone agrees with you. you know? So we just have to understand that that's a fact, that there's a lot of disagreement in the world, and that's okay. And we should be able to have open dialogue and discussion about these various opinions and ideas without it coming to hostility, anger, violence, or whatever the case is, okay? So that's just another barrier to critical thinking. Just calm down, chill out, let's talk about our ideas, you know? There's, not, there's no harm in that. Nobody's ever been harmed by discussion. Information by itself is harmless. It's the people who do things on the basis of the information from some kind of uh, emotional overdrive position that causes a lot of the problems. Okay. <clears throat> so that's anger. Um, next we'll mention cliches, okay? So what are cliches? Hmm. All right, so what is a cliche, at least as a barrier to critical thinking? It's like um, these overused common phrases or sayings, one-liner phrases a lot of the time, and the point of them is to try and stop a critical discussion in its tracks. Let me just go up, though, and make sure I'm not ignoring any comments. I've seen some interesting ones here. Um, oh, he, Kitty can stay. Well, she's always back and forth, so she'll definitely be back again. Um, Today's political climate, yes, sad to say, we've had, I think, um, you know, better time periods in our history even recently uh, in the sort of low point that we seem to be at right now in terms of um, civility between people of different polarized political opinion. Sums up Twitter, yes, there's a lot of Twitter wars that go on with people of different opinions and 
sometimes that's fun, sometimes it gets out of control. Um, in a civil academic sort of setting or in an everyday life setting, we should try to maybe do better than, um, than what we see on Twitter, where a lot of times because of there's all the anonymity, people feel free to say whatever they want, things they would never say in person. You know, you're gonna attack someone like that online, you would not say that in person, or you probably get hurt. Um, Alexandria, so when one becomes angry, would you say they'd be in denial? Well, you know, um, denial is kind of a distinct concept, but they can definitely come together. We're actually going to mention denial in a minute, so I'll hold that for the moment. And then Lena, Twitter matter everything on the daily, yes, yes, for sure. Okay, so cliches then. Uh, these are overused one-liner phrases that try to stop critical discussion from going forward. So, Okay, cliches, overused, one-liners. These are common phrases and expressions. We've heard them before. We'll get, we'll mention some in a minute. But they're overused one-line phrases that basically have the intended goal of stopping a critical discussion in its tracks or stopping any further analysis from going forward. Um, so let's ask: If there were two people having like a you know interesting intellectual back and forth about uh, different opinions or beliefs. Maybe one person's pro-life, one person's pro-choice, you know, and they're exchanging their arguments. And pro-life guys like, yeah, but that's a human being with human DNA. Pro-choice person's like, yeah, but the woman has the right to choose. I mean, this isn't a fully uh, formed person yet. The fetus in its fetal state doesn't have the kind of comprehension that gives it the same status as a full adult. The other person says back, but that, that's ridiculous. You know, isn't merely having two human parents and having human form sufficient to have the right to life. So they're going back and forth. But then um, one of the two people, let's say, is getting basically uh, losing their patience with the conversation and doesn't want to go any further with it. What do you think might be a, a saying, a phrase, a little one-liner that might be dropped at that point in the conversation to try and duck out of it and get out to, to something else or even just to change the topic? What do you think? People like these two people are just having a, a long-winded debate or argument and when one person's tired of it, they throw out a phrase like this, which signals to the other person, let's move on. What do you think? Agree to disagree. Okay, very good, Gabriel. Exactly. Something like that. Um, agree to disagree. There's more. There's, it is what it is. Exactly. There's whatever. Um, to each his own. Um, let's see. That's how the cookie crumbles. Boys will be boys. You know, so when any of these phrases are used, the point that's made by using this phrase is let's just dis disengage and discontinue further discussion. If you're saying to the person, let's agree to disagree, it's like you're saying, I don't want to have to you know, make the argument any longer. Um, now, the thing is, um, in a way also, these phrases don't make much logical sense. Agree to disagree. We're not agreeing on anything. If we disagree, then we disagree about agreeing on the point. We're not, a, you know, if, if the people agreed to disagree, then they would be fine with the fact that the other person has a different opinion. But by virtue of the very fact that you don't agree with them, then you, go, you, you don't want them to hold that different opinion. So um, it is what it is. Everything is what it is. There's nothing that's not identical with itself. So that doesn't make any uh, informative information. It just sort of signals again, let's stop talking. So um, let me look at what the book provides on this point. <clears throat> yeah, so cliches. Resorting to cliches, often repeated statements such as to each his own, It'll all work out for the best. It's all relative. I have a right to my opinion, um, and so forth. Uh, they basically stop the critical thinking from going on. Now, in life, sometimes we don't have unlimited time, though, to keep on discussing matters with other people with whom we disagree. So it's actually fair at some point when you've exhausted all of your reasons and when you, there's no further um, information to exchange to say, you know, I think we've reached the end of the line of this dialogue, and we're just going to have to agree to disagree. The problem, though, is that people typically deploy these cliches way before that, and it becomes sort of a habit, and when you do it by second nature, then you get into the habit of never having interesting intellectual exchanges with other people. Every time anything comes up, it's always, oh, whatever, uh, just let it go, agree to disagree. 
Um, so I think of it according to a little metaphor. It's kind of like salt. Salt's a good thing and it's necessary for a good diet, but if you have too much of it, then it becomes unhealthy. So you should use it sparingly. But these cliches, it's sort of the same way. If your first instinct every time someone says, hey, you know, I don't agree with that, it's just to throw up your hands and be like, look, whatever, you know, we're just to, to each their own. If that's always your first instinct, then you're overdoing it. You should only use these if and when there's really no further productive exchange of ideas that is possible. But going to them as a first resort means that we never end up having the meeting of the minds. That's important to um, critical dialogue and, and analysis. Okay, so that's the cliches. And we gave some examples of different phrases that fit that description. Um, from here, we will now talk about denial. Okay, so denial. So one simply denies alternative views instead of even analyzing their credibility. Denial. So it's a little different from avoidance uh, because with avoidance, it's like the ostrich that puts their head in the sand. You don't even hear the contrary ideas or opinions because you're trying to avoid them completely. With denial, you may allow yourself to be exposed to the contrary ideas or information, but you simply deny them without any further thought. Um, so we should be willing at least to open our minds enough to take seriously critical arguments, even when they're to the contrary of what we are inclined to ourselves to believe. Um, some people, of course, you know, they just can't be swayed. It's like they're so committed to the belief they have that they'll deny any evidence, even if it's very strong, overwhelming evidence to the contrary. You know, so if somebody believes the earth is flat, you're going to show them photos of the earth that's a sphere, and they're going to be like, oh, those are fake. You're going to tell the person, look, that's not how satellites work. They have to fall in an elliptical orbit around the planet earth uh, in the free fall of a void of space. And that person says, ah, those scientists really got you, right? That's, they tricked you. So, you know, People who practice denial are not even willing to open mind enough to listen to the contrary evidence or ideas. Um, so we owe it to ourselves to give a fair shot to all the opinions and ideas that are out there. Unless it's been absolutely proven beyond all conceivable doubt, um, we shouldn't just deny the force of alternative viewpoints. And sometimes it might not have to do with like these theoretical questions, the shape of the earth, is, is climate change real? You know, like a climate denialist would, would be one example of this. Um, but sometimes it's in your individual life, too. Like, say a person's way too drunk to drive, and it's obvious to everybody, and it should be obvious to them, too, but they're just in denial. They're like, ah, you don't know how I am. You don't know, you know how I work. My body, I can handle it. Uh, you know, even though I'm blowing point two out of this breathalyzer, I'm just, I'm fine. You need to understand I'm fine. And so you can't convince them, no matter what appeal to their reason that you might make. So we're going to be good critical thinkers, and we're not going to act that way. We're going to try our best to keep an open mind, even when, and especially when, uh, we're receiving challenges to our views. Okay. Yeah, that's funny. Okay, so if you refer to the moon and be like, look at the moon. I mean, obviously, it's something that's a sphere. And then, you know, there's people who don't deny that there was a moon landing itself. I don't know how that could be seriously believed by anybody. What would be the point to, uh, to give people beliefs about the moon that they that are not true so that we could all... Who, who profits or benefits off of a fit, uh, false beliefs that the moon landing happened. I mean, that's just like a conspiracy with no point if people believe that. But anyway, okay. So that's the denial case. And now there's also ignorance. <clears throat> so ignorance is, in our book, defined as um, when you deliberately remain uninformed about something so that you don't have to take a position or any action about that. That's kind of the um, willful ignorance, as it sometimes is called. Okay, so ignorance. Um, <clears throat> one deliberately, you know, on purpose, remains uninformed. About a topic. To avoid um, taking a position or an action.
this Okay, morning. ignorance. Um, sometimes, ignorance and avoidance, well, avoidance is avoiding the people and the information. Ignorance is um, not knowing anything about the topic, one way or the other, even information that bears uh, on any opinion. So with avoid, here's the right answer to your question, Jamie, it's a good question. With avoidance, you already have an established opinion on the topic, and what you're avoiding are differences of opinion or contrary opinions or evidence that other people have. But with ignorance, you don't even form an opinion in the first place, one way or the other. You just say, I've got no opinion because I know nothing about the subject. So it's like the difference between, like, avoidance would be a person who says, climate change is not real, there's no such thing as climate change, um, and I'm going to avoid all the people and all the evidence that says it is real. That person has a position, and they're avoiding the contrary side of the argument. With ignorance, though, it would be about climate change. I can't tell you whether I believe it's real or not, because me, I'm totally uninformed. I'm ignorant of all the literature, the scientific arguments. I don't know anything about the evidence, so I'm the wrong person to ask. I don't got an opinion on this. That's a person who says, I profess no knowledge on the topic because I'm unaware of anything about it. What's the problem, though, with that appeal to ignorance? The problem is that the information is, is widely available in a publicly consumable format that anyone can get, especially on the internet. So um, when you claim and plead ignorance as an excuse for not having any belief on some question or not taking an action on that question, it's a barrier to critical thinking if the information is available to you and you're just choosing not to look for it. I would say, especially in this internet age that we are living in, it's much harder even to plead ignorance because a simple Google search can pretty much inform you about most all things. So. Um, like there's an example in the book, it gives the case of like after a major earthquake, like the one that happened in Haiti, uh, like 10 years ago. Um, so it's a big disaster, it caused massive damage and destruction. Suppose someone's thinking, I'd like to donate to help relieve, uh, the suffering of the people that were affected. So I'd like to give some charitable donation to an aid organization. Uh, but they're like, ah, but I can't do it though, because I just don't know which ones are, uh, reputable. I don't want to give my money to like some... Um, you know, to some scammers that are going to use the money for things that don't really help anybody. But I don't know the difference between what's a scam uh, aid agency and what's a legitimate one. So I'm ignorant about that. Therefore, I'm not going to be able to take an action. You see? But what's the problem with this claim of ignorance? Once again, there's um, Charity Navigator. There's all kinds of uh, reputable sources that will provide detailed analysis as to the track record and of various aid agencies in the past. So when the information's out there, you really can't excuse yourself from action or, or at least opinion um, when you could have sought it out. Sean, what if someone believes they are informed on a situation but they only have one side? Would that be avoidance or ignorance? Well, um, it's like a choice to be ignorant, right, Natalie? Yes. I would think that's a little bit more on the avoidance side because they have a viewpoint. Maybe their viewpoint's not sufficiently well-based in evidence. Um, so I guess there could be a little bit of an overlap. You know, these concepts can bleed into each other a little bit. Certainly a person who does the one is going to be more likely to do the other as well because they all kind of uh, feed into each other. You know, the, being the kind of person who gets angry at different information is also the sort of person who would avoid people that don't agree with them, is also the sort of person who would probably not want to look up information if it put them to the point of action where they had to make a, a judgment. So there's definitely overlap, and it makes sense for us to see some of that, Sean. Um, I think of the case of, well, I think actually that's a decent description. I'm going to save another example for a different definition that I think will work a bit better. So we've got a couple more of these. Um, next is conformity. <clears throat> now, conformity is a word that I think is in most of our vocabulary by now. You know, you've probably heard this word or used it in your life. Um, what do you think is a conformist? Anybody have an idea about that? What is the what is the behavior or the tendency of conformity? What do you think that is? Is it well? You'll see. I'll see what you say. <clears throat> conformity. Any takers? Change. It's not exactly change, Natalie. Jamie, that's a little closer, right? Hopping on a bandwagon. And Gabriel, you say it as to simply agree. Um, so there's some kernel of truth in those, those uh, suggestions. Um, conformity, to change or be different. So yeah, I'm interested in the thought that people are saying change. That's not so much to do with it. 
Hannah, it's more in that case, to fit in with everyone else. When you side, and Joshua, you say when you side with something you don't really agree with, well, you might agree with it um, and harbor some doubts, um, or you might just want to portray yourself as believing it because it's what most people believe. That's definitely part of it. To have your beliefs comply with those around you, also good, Jamie. Okay, settling with an opinion, also pretty correct. Let me put the definition here, and this will bring together all of your guys' comments, okay? So conformity, that's when you just take up the belief, you adopt the belief or the position uh, of either the majority or of what you think is the popular crowd. And why do you think someone would want to go with the group, go with the majority, or go with the crowd? It's because they want to fit in, right? The person wants to fit in and be a part of that bigger majority group or that popular group. So they'll align themselves with those beliefs. Um, even if they do harbor some kind of private or personal doubts about it, because they don't want to be excluded. It's wanting to fit in and, and, um, and not be like uh, left out. Okay, so conformity. <clears throat> One adopts the belief that is, sorry, let me say this. One adopts the belief of the majority or what's popular um, to avoid standing out and to fit in, to fit in and avoid standing out. So that's conformity. Taking the belief or maybe the action that you think is the most widespread majority action or the most popular thing to do. And why would one do that? Because of the desire to fit in with the group and also, same thing, a desire not to be standing out from the group excluded or like, like a loner or whatever. Um, starting really young in life, people develop this kind of uh, habit and it's uh, kind of foisted upon us through our socialization. Um, when you're young and you're developing your identity, you want to align yourself with various groups. You want to be a part of something. You want to feel like you belong. And so that does push people to assign themselves these identities by taking on the beliefs that they think are prevalent within the group. Um, sometimes we see it in like fashion trends. You know, everyone's got the Nike Air Force Ones or whatever. Um, so sometimes you wear or do those things just because you think that's what everyone else is doing. You want to fit in with what's popular. Um, and that's totally expected and normal in a way because animals like human beings are, uh, especially human beings, are social animals. We are, I've heard it described as we are a herd animal. Some of the famous um, madmen, marketing uh, gurus of the earlier 20th century who built up this culture where we got a ton of advertisements always in our face, they said, you know, man is a herd animal. If we can get advertisements out there that make him feel like you've got to buy this or else you're not a part of the group, then we, that's an effective marketing tactic or a sales pitch. So whether it's consumer choices, whether it's political beliefs, whether it's personal um, beliefs or whatever, religious beliefs, uh, sometimes conformity is the thing that's causing the person to, to, to hold those views instead of their own independent judgment. Now, the thing is, sometimes uh, there's no problem with that. You know, the group itself could be correct, or you might think that the majority has the right opinion, and that's therefore just authorized by your own judgment. The problem, though, is when you do it just to fit in, and um, you don't even think about it on your own. And it's even worse when you do have doubts, but you try to stifle or suppress them because you don't want it to be revealed that you're an outsider in the group. Um, there's like some famous, I mean, these are kind of cliches too, but they're funny little phrases. Your parents or someone has probably said this to you before. Uh, if, you, if all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump off too? That's kind of like a classic anti-conformity uh, principle that like a, a moral that parents try to get to kids or sometimes they do. Um, the sort of lesson there is, if you're such a conformist and you want to do what's always popular and what the group is doing, then what if they all do something really self-destructive and harmful? Are you going to do that too? If you do, then you're going to be worse off because you didn't think for yourself. So um, think for yourself. Be an independent individual mentally. Um, if you agree with people, that's fine, but it should be based on your own powers of judgment, not just a desire to fit in. Um, after all, sometimes what the group is doing is not the right thing. You know, If you had been a conformist, I don't know, um, 150 years ago, uh, you would have been, if you're a free member of society, holding the opinion that women shouldn't vote, that there should still be slaves. Uh, well, that's a little further than that time period, but you get the picture, right? So the prevalent opinion or status quo belief is something that's sometimes worthy of being challenged. Um, and if you're just a conformist, then you'll never be able to 
to tell the difference between when it's something that's really true or when you're just following along to get along with people. Okay, so be willing to be your own independent individual. Um, sometimes people fear standing out. There's a there's an old Japanese saying I think that is a uh, the nail that stands out will be hammered down. So people kind of don't want to be that one nail that's out of place that gets that additional scrutiny. Um, but you know, this life that you're living is your life, and therefore you got to try and be the independent individual that you are and find your own way in the world. So conformity stands in the way of that. <clears throat> It was not too long ago, I was driving around in Orange County, um, and I took a left turn on the street, and um, I did it because I saw, that's the, that was the street I had to turn left on, but I also saw there was like three cars ahead of me that all did the same thing. So when I took that left, I noticed right away, oh, there's construction workers everywhere, and people with hard hats, and there's signs up that says this block is closed for construction. And I kind of had to proceed, and he saw me in my car, and he yells out, he's like, what are you doing on this block? Don't you see the signs? They're everywhere. It says you're not supposed to be here. And I just said to him, well, you know, I mean, there's three other, four other cars ahead of me. I guess I wasn't thinking, and I just followed them because I figured they knew that the block was fine. And he said, he right there, you know, he's like, well, what if your friends all jumped off a bridge? Would you do the same thing? You know, and I was like, wow, okay, you're you're definitely giving, you're schooling me on uh, conformity right here in the real world. So a little anecdote for you, but um, it happens in all kinds of different cases across the board. Okay, so one more of the uh, barriers to critical thinking and then I'll try to talk to you a little bit about the last few terms in the book, which are forms of narrow-mindedness at the very end. Well, not of the book, but of chapter one. So, <clears throat> one more struggling. So, as it's described in the book, this is um, endlessly struggling over what action or position to take, and never, ever um, coming to a conclusion. Okay. <clears throat> Here. Never reaching a conclusion. Struggling, one more barrier to critical thinking. So um, <clears throat> sometimes people have a hard time making up their mind, basically. They've looked at the two sides of the argument, so it's not the same as like avoidance or ignorance. They've looked at all the information, and they're aware of it. The problem in this case is that they just can't make up their mind as to what to think um, based on the information. So now at some level, struggling over a decision or an action is reasonable. Um, because you do have to take some time to deliberate on it. You have to take some time to contemplate the factors that, that are at hand and then to take the right action or to stake out the right position on the, on the topic. So some degree of struggling is to be expected, and that's normal. But the problem is when it becomes never-ending and it just goes on and on forever. At that point, if you never reach a conclusion, it's like a waste of all the intellectual labor that you put in to trying to make up your mind. So struggle somewhat but not indefinitely and forever and never come to a conclusion. Okay, so like, um, I can give you some different examples here. We've got an election coming up, so it's a good example to use for this. Say that a person is trying to make up their mind on the presidential candidates, right? So there's Trump and there's Biden. And the person has studied the two different uh, candidates' positions and platforms, and they're pretty well aware of what they're offering, uh, the American people and what they want to do in another, um, in, for the next four years, for the next term. So you ask this person, what is your vote going to be when it comes to the election that we got coming up? And they're like, you know, that's a good question. Um, thing is, I'm still thinking about it. I'm kind of really torn on this question. I'm struggling. I, I know that there's reasons for the one and there's reasons for the other, but I just have a difficult uh, choice to make. I'm still, I'm still looking at it. I'm still thinking it over. I'm mulling it over in my mind. I'm struggling with this. So you're going to have to check with me later. I haven't quite decided. Okay, so this is like maybe a month before the election. Then it's getting close to the election. You talk to him again. It's like a week away. What's going to be? Now it's getting close to time to vote. So I'm sure you made up your mind now. I'm, like, I'm struggling to the last minute on this. This is going to be a tough call. I keep going back and forth. On the one hand, this guy's saying this, and the other guy's the guy saying that. Um, so I'm, it's still a struggle. I really can't tell you yet. 
Now you talk to them after the whole election's over. It's been done for like a week. And uh, you're like, well, how did you end up voting in the election? Wasn't that a crazy election? And they say, ah, oh, you know what? I ended up not voting. I just, I was struggling and struggling. I couldn't make up my mind to the very last moment. And then I just decided I have to skip this election because if I can't make up my mind, I'm not going to vote. And what's the problem there? The person spent a lot of time thinking about it. They had a lot of information that they could have used to make a decision, but they ended up making no decision at all, taking no action at all. So, you know, isn't that a waste of time and effort intellectually to spend in the contemplation of these concepts and ideas and then not to even have any results at the end? So critical thinking and analysis is good, but there's a point to it. You're supposed to come to a conclusion. You're supposed to form an opinion. So allow yourself to form opinions and come to conclusions and take actions as the consequence of the analysis that you do. If it just goes nowhere, then it's like you're spinning your wheels and you're not getting anywhere and you're not doing anything productive with all the time spent thinking it over. I think a little bit of, this just came to my mind, because you know, actually I used to study literature a little bit. Um, that was my major in college before I switched to philosophy. I think a little bit of the example of Hamlet. Any of you guys have ever heard or read that play? Well, in Hamlet, um, the Prince of Denmark is Hamlet, and you know, his father is basically killed by poison from his uncle. And um, he knows that, but people don't all know that. He's been visited by the ghost of his father who told it to him, so he knows it. Um, anyway, he keeps having these thoughts, like, I need to kill my uncle. This is messed up. He, he basically assassinated my dad, and now he's taking the throne, and he's going to marry my mom. Um, uh, this is just messed up and completely wrong. Uh, but he can't make himself make his mind up. He keeps thinking, well, I could, I could kill my uncle, and then, you know, that would be just. Or I could just chill and let this happen. And he dithers and dithers and thinks it over, and he doesn't act. There's this one famous scene where he's, like, viewing the usurper of the throne, and he's in a hidden location with a knife, and he could easily kill him, but he chooses not to. Now, I'm not advising anyone to ever kill another person, of course, but um, in the case of Hamlet, he's famous for that inaction, for his difficulty in making um, commitments and choices. So just another touchstone to kind of help us think about that concept, all right? So yeah, um, from here, the textbook refers to different forms of narrow-mindedness, okay? And really, I think of it as just more barriers to critical thinking. It's kind of the same thing, same theme, but they wanted to break it into two categories. You've got the normal barriers that we've covered here, and then there's like a set of them that they call forms of narrow-mindedness. So here are some forms of narrow-mindedness, just another subcategory of barriers and obstacles to critical thinking. Okay, now, um, I want to get through as many of them as I can, because this is the last piece of notes um, that's relevant to the quiz that you guys have coming up. So I'm just going to list the topics here. I'll try to talk through them, and in the study guide that I provide you guys later, I could give maybe a little bit more detail, because I want to get it in with the last few minutes, okay? So first of all, there's absolutism. And there is egocentrism. There is ethnocentrism. Anthropocentrism. Okay, and then... <clears throat> There's rationalization. And um, one more I'm going to put here at the bottom, double think. Okay, so let me first go over these four here, starting at absolutism. So what is absolutism? It's a form of narrow-mindedness with a person basically who has this uh, way of thinking. It's a person who places complete and total trust in authority figures and does not have the ability to challenge what they say. So they always believe that authority figures are absolutely correct and they cannot um, challenge their views. So it's the kind of person who lacks the ability to challenge authority. Um, if you can't stand up to authority and you always blindly assume that they're absolutely right, then you're an absolutist. And what is the authority figure who you defer to? Well, it depends on the case of which absolutist we're talking about. It could be a political leader, a religious leader. Um, it could be a cult figure or something. Uh, it could be the person's parents or um, a superior officer or something who's mentoring them. 
But the thing is, even when there are people in positions of authority who are delivering information to us, we have to be willing and able to question that information sometimes and to think about it on our own. So absolutism, once again, um, always assuming that authority figures are completely correct and not being able to stand up to them. All right. Egocentrism. Egocentrism is a term I think probably a lot of you have heard before, so maybe this will be familiar to you. It's basically being self-centered. It's the type of trait where a person thinks that they're better and smarter than everyone else, and so they do not have very high level of respect for other people's views or opinions, especially if they don't agree with you. Um, so egocentrism, kind of like being egotistical, having a very high opinion of yourself, inflated beyond perhaps what's true, and then having low level of respect and concern for other people's opinions. Now, um, it's good to have self-esteem, right? But it's going too far when you have like narcissism and egocentrism. Um, because you can easily be manipulated by people who know how to appeal to your ego. You know, if you're the most egotistical person, all that somebody who uh, wants to get something out of you has to do is just flatter you and shower you with compliments. So if they start saying, hey, you're the best and smartest person ever, and you're full of yourself and you're egocentric, then you'll be like, yeah, I am. And by the way, I like you. Uh, do you need something from me? And now this person is able to manipulate and exploit you. Also, the egocentric type, you know, they don't have a very honest and clear estimation of their own intellectual ability compared to others. So if you just puff them up and flatter them, you can easily win concessions back. Um, so egocentric people sometimes also overestimate their strengths and underestimate their weaknesses. And that means that they could, um, you know, set themselves up for a fall by rushing into situations that they don't have full control over, but their ego makes them think that they do. Um, you know, if you're so egocentric, you might think you know better than the authorities, even when they tell you, hey, take this medicine or evacuate from your house or whatever the case is. So have confidence and self-esteem, but don't think that you're better and so on than everybody else. Everyone has a reasonable opinion and, you know, we're a big world with billions of people and you're just one. So definitely the world doesn't revolve around any single person, much less just one of us random people. Okay. Now, ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is the unjustified belief, unjustified belief in the superiority of a person's race, culture, or religion, okay? So if you think of like white supremacists and stuff, that's ethnocentrism. The unjustified belief in the superiority of a person's own race, group, or culture. Unjustified, because it's not justified. Um, uh, it's sad to say that there are people who believe that the races of the world, of human beings, have a hierarchy among them, and that somehow there's like a top of the pyramid of people who are the most, you know, wise or moral or whatever, just due to their genetic inheritance and their phenotypical traits. That's absolutely false. It's provably false. We're all human beings. We're all the same species. We all have the same human genome. Okay, so like almost all the information in the human genome is exactly the same in every single human being, and it's imprinted in every strand of DNA in your body. Um, the phenotypical traits that account for your skin color, eye color, hair etc. Those do not have anything to do with the person's moral or intellectual abilities. A, a baby, an infant that's born today, which, which has any physical description, whether that's a white, baby, black, Hispanic, Asian, or whatever, is going to grow up with the language, culture, norms, and customs of the community and the society that's born into. So it's not as if a person has some innate advantage over other people depending on the genetic characteristics of their outside appearance. It's definitely false. I think we all know that. You know, this young generation of people that you guys are, I believe, recognizes that. But unfortunately, um, there's powerful currents in the world that, for some reason, uh, cause people to fall back onto these outdated and false beliefs. So we got to, you know, resist that and make sure not to um, harbor those tendencies within ourselves if we did. So yet again, ethnocentrism, the unjustified belief in the superiority of a person's race, group, or culture. Okay? Now... <clears throat> Anthropocentrism is the belief in uh, that mankind, human beings, are at the center of everything and are thus more important uh, than the non-human animals and nature. In my opinion, I don't really think that the text needed to give this uh, on a par with some of the other isms that you see above. Because I would argue that you know it actually is fair and reasonable to say that we humans are superior to the animals uh, and to the other parts of nature. But... The, I think, you know, kernel of truth in this is that if you go overboard with the belief that only human lives matter and nothing else in the universe is important, animals, not important, nature and, you know, the ecosystem is not that important. 
if you really uh, put us on such a pedestal and where nothing else has any importance, then you might end up uh, destroying aspects of the natural environment or the ecosystem that we all rely on for our survival. You know, so um, uh, certainly we're rational animals and we have language and we have, you know, technology and we have uh, college classes like this. Um, so we're more, much more advanced than the other animals. That can't be denied. But that doesn't mean that we should not take care of uh, nature and try to preserve it so that we have a planet that we can continue to live on and survive on into the future. So anthropocentrism with a little asterisk in my mind, it's not as pernicious or uh, irrational perhaps as the belief that other human beings are inferior to you. Uh, but yet taken to its extremes, I think it provides for um, unstable conditions on the planet earth for human beings to live in over time. Okay, and we see that you know, uh, as the climate has its challenges over, over the last couple of generations. Um, okay, now rationalization. Rationalization is when you um, do something without thinking critically. So you just do it off of an impulse or a spur of the moment or like a random whim. But then later on, when people ask you why you did it, you invent a reason after the fact so that it sounds like you were being rational. So it's to rationalize an action that was done for no good reason. Um, you know, suppose that uh, I'm a person who's just lazy and when it comes to choosing a major for college, um, I don't think critically and I'm like, what's the easiest one? Just whichever one I think is the easiest, I'm the major in that. Then, you know, your parents ask you, why are you majoring in um, stick figures? And you're like, well, uh, because, you know, I heard that the stick figure industry is actually really marketable. It's growing right now. So you're coming up with a reason to just justify your action and make it sound like it was deliberate and it was really... Uh, the product of a long train of reflection. Um, you know, we've all done rationalization before. Me, here's a case. I was out at the mall one time, and I always wanted to get Timberland boots. You guys know Tim's? They're kind of like rugged looking, like East Coast style boots or whatever. I always wanted a pair, but I never kind of had a real reason to do it because I live in California. And, you know, but one day I just wanted to get them, and I was out there and I had extra money. So just impulse buy, I got the Tim's. Later on, I had people asking me, like friends and stuff, what are you doing with those Tims? Why'd you buy those? And uh, it actually turned out that I had a trip to the East Coast coming up. So instead of just saying, what, I'm an impulse person, I just buy things randomly, I used that. I said, well, you know, actually, I'm going to the East Coast in a couple of weeks. And last time I was over in a cold part of the world, I went to Iceland and I was walking around in Adidas and I kept slipping everywhere. Uh, so now I've got some nice rugged boots with tread on the bottom so I won't fall over. Now that's a good reason. That's a very good reason to get those. It's like you're preparing for a winter vacation. But that wasn't on my mind when I actually did it. Um, so it's rationalization. Maybe another person wakes up on the day of the election, right? And they're just feeling lazy. They're like, I got to go out to the polling place because I didn't mail in my ballot. So, uh, but if I go to the polling place, you know, I'm, then I can't just sit here and watch YouTube videos. So whatever, I'm feeling lazy. I'm not going to vote. Now, later on, someone asks them, what did, what did you do with the vote? You say, I didn't vote. Like, why not? And now they give you some kind of like long-winded answer about politics. They're like, you know, because it's futile, because democracy's dead, that's why. Because, you know, if you think about it, our votes don't really matter, nothing changes. Now all of a sudden this person's like dishing on some kind of big political um, manifesto, but actually they didn't have any of those reasons. They were just being lazy in the first place. So long story short, when we act, when we do things, try to have the reasons up front. Don't just try to make them up after the fact later so that it sounds like you had some kind of reasonable um, approach to the action. You know, Make sure that those reasons are available to you in the advance uh, so that when you do things, you're doing them based on your own good judgment and some kind of logic instead of just doing things randomly and having to make it appear to people later as though it was a reasonable act. Okay? Um, yeah, does that make sense to you guys, rationalization? I hope it does. Well, there's last one here, and it's double think. You may be, any of you who have read the book 1984 by George Orwell, this word comes out of that book, and it's kind of just become a, a term in psychology and in, in this kind of class. So double think is just to believe two opposite things at the same time. It's believing two things that contradict each other. Like saying, for example, um, you know, I believe that... Um, that gay people, should, same-sex couples should be able to marry each other, and that's their right. But also, I don't want my kid to marry someone of the same sex. See, those two things are not consistent. If you believe that anyone should be able to marry the person they love, but also my child should only be able to marry people you know, of the opposite gender or whatever, and that would be two contradictory beliefs, and it's double-think. Sometimes people want to have it both ways, 
and they don't relinquish one of two beliefs that contradicts another one. You know, like somebody could say, men and women are totally equal. But I also believe that when it comes to household labor, the women should be doing most of the house chores and stuff because that's just, that's the role of a woman. Now, what is it? Does the person want to say women have, you know, the domestic and the maternal duties and the men should just be workers or that men and women are equal? Those are two things that seem to be contradictory to each other. But sometimes a person has this kind of um, mental experience of, of believing them both. So we got to make sure that our beliefs are at least consistent. When you have two beliefs and they cancel each other out, then you got to find out for yourself which one do you really believe in and the other one has to be withdrawn. Unfortunately, a lot of times people go through their lives with a set of contradictory beliefs. And if you actually examine what they think, you, real, you realize that they're not really making sense. This person believes in two things that are the opposite of each other. Let's see in the book what's mentioned on that. And then we're kind of to the end here. Men should stay home and clean, eat the rich, overthrow the patriarchy. You know, uh, that, was, that would be taking it in the other direction, right? So we want to be, you know, fair to both sides, I guess. But, but I have There's double think. So it says here, double think involves holding two contradictory views or double standards at the same time and believing that they're both true. This is particularly prevalent in response to highly charged issues. Rather than analyze the arguments surrounding the issues, people may unknowingly engage in double think. For example, when asked, most college students say they believe in the equality of men and women. However, when it comes to lifestyle and career, the same students that claim that also say women should be the primary caretakers of children. Most teachers, even those that are strict feminists, treat their female students differently from their male students. So it's like, you know, you say men and women students should be treated the same, but then their behavior exposes that maybe they have a bias towards one or the other. Um, so it says here, similarly, the majority of white Americans champion equality as a principle when it comes to race, but may harbor unconscious prejudice. So, um, and then last point, double think can have an impact on our real life decisions. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, Women, including those who work full-time outside the home, still perform the great majority of housework and child care. So they're just expanding on that example. Um, so, yeah, you just want to try and make sure that you don't harbor contradictory or um, internally inconsistent beliefs. Um, now, to be fair, there's one more term that was placed at the very end, but I guess I've run out of the time for it. I'll just mention it, but I'm not going to put it on the quiz. And the last term was cognitive dissonance. I do want you to think or know about it, though. Cognitive dissonance is when your uh, beliefs or behaviors become challenged by new beliefs or social behaviors in the world. So like um, members of older generations sometimes experience this social or cognitive dissonance. If they grew up in a world where there was not all these different genders or something, and now that they see that's becoming a more normal thing, then they can experience the tension between the old normal and the new normal. And that kind of cognitive dissonance is sometimes a phenomenon that people struggle with. Um, Basically, to get rid of the cognitive dissonance, a lot of times you have to like relax your attachment to your old way of thinking or acting to make room for what's new. Um, now, the only thing about that that I was thinking when I read it in the book, though, is that sometimes the cognitive dissonance could be because the world used to be better and now it's getting worse, right? So sometimes you wouldn't want to resolve the cognitive dissonance by allowing for something new because what's coming in to replace it is worse. Like suppose that you were a citizen in Nazi Germany before the Holocaust and now, now Hitler has taken power and you know, uh, the human rights of people are being completely violated. Um, if that's the new normal, then you definitely don't want to say, well, I got to make way for the new normal because I used to believe in human rights, but now they say some people are subhuman or they don't have the right to life. Um, so anyway, in the most generous way of looking at it, oftentimes our old, outmoded, irrational beliefs are challenged by new, better, and more modern beliefs. But of course, the opposite is sometimes possible too, depending on the case. So. In those cases, you might want to hold on to your cherished beliefs, actually, um, but it does depend. Sometimes people who are forced to live in new circumstances uh, are made to confront their cognitive dissonance. So, like, if you went on an exchange to live in a highly different culture, you might feel the tension between what you expect and what you think is normal and then what people do there. But since there's a lot of different frames of reference in this world, we have to be um, flexible enough to, to take on all those different um, environments. Okay, guys, so we've basically finished with all the uh, chapter one. I'll send you guys a good detailed study guide so you can be fully ready for the quiz on uh, Monday. And I'll also provide everyone the clear directions. It's not anything complicated. You're basically going to get the quiz form through Titania. And then you're going to just send me back your completed answers within the window of time given by the class period. So before 345. When I've ever given these quizzes in person, when we used to have face-to-face -face classes, it's like 15 or 16 questions. And most students... Um, We'll always finish it like well in advance of the full class period. So 
it's more than enough time basically for you to be able to do it. Um, but that's what we have on Monday. So I'll also post the answer key for your first homework. And starting on Friday, I'll deliver you a message that says, feel free to now um, ask me for your score. And I'll deliver you your score through a, a little email exchange. Okay, guys, everything's good then? Are, are we good to go? Um, if so, let me know. You can uh, tell me in the chat or just hit the like button. But um, appreciate you guys again. Thanks so much for all your work and help. And uh, I guess I'll just see you then back after the weekend. So have a good weekend for now. And um, I'll be in touch through Titanium. Follow your announcements, okay? And thanks again. Have a great one. <clears throat>